Live Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on the time you watch this. Uh, if you're watching, because I don't know if you're watching it live or in what I call the zombie mode. That doesn't mean you're dead. That just means you're not watching it live. It's just a very stupid joke, I know. Uh, but anyway, aside of that, to all of you, hello, how are you? I can just I just saw you are connected on YouTube. As you know, I never trust it. And as always, I have to say before I introduce my guest for today, my fine and polite public service announcement. Let me get ready. Wear your fucking mask. <laughs> Let me repeat. Wear your fucking mask. Uh, if you're suicidal and you want to kill yourself, there's your problem. As the Romans would say, die. I don't care. But I care about everybody that, else that you can get killed for being an asshole. That's the part that worries me. It's not about you. The mask doesn't protect you. It protects others from you. So please wear your mask. Protect your elders. Protect your family. Protect your kids. Protect your girlfriend, your boyfriend. That, that person you haven't seen in six months that you're so eager to see that you forget to wear your mask. You embrace that person. You hug that person. You can kill him or her. So please wear your mask. And if I always, as I always say, if you believe you're stronger than God and you don't need a mask because you will survive anything and that you don't care about anything else, please leave this channel now. I don't want you here. I don't want potential killers or assholes. That's it. Anyway, after that fine, polite way to say things that I always have. Hello, John. How are you, my friend? I'm fine. Fine. It's great to see you. And I just need you to know that if if being an asshole is a deadly uh, thing, there'd be a lot of dead people in the New York City area. I just want you to know that. A lot. I thought things. Were, I thought uh, people was was more or less respectful in New York. Oh well, I, I joke because I just drove a good distance, and when you're on the roads here, everybody's an asshole, and they're always in front of me when I'm driving. Okay, that's uh, yeah. Well, driving in New York, that that's an odyssey. That's an odyssey. <laughs> I exaggerate. It's uh, there's a w lot of wonderful people in New York. I just was joking. <laughs> I know. Um, what is the how is the situation in New York? Is it getting better? Is it still uh, as crazy as it came to be here in Spain? How is the, how's things for you guys? It has improved significantly. And uh, unfortunately, it went through the horrors that it did. We did. We're outside of the city. But uh, the city itself is still suffering. However, it's not as severe as it was. It is improving. And it's gotten significantly better. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine I'm your doctor. Call me Frankenstein. I get with my syringe, pop, pop you, you know, with my <laughs> miracle drug, whatever, vaccine. And we are all safe. We are told we can leave the house. We can do whatever we want. What's the thing you miss the most? Uh, dining out and uh, taking my wife out to dinner and for drinks somewhere. Uh, socializing is what we miss. Now, we do have moments and we are getting our uh, friends and family together. But going into public forums is what I miss, just being out. Uh, that's the great thing about New York. There's so much to do. We haven't been able to, and I miss that. Yeah, and you're Italian as I am a Spaniard, you know, for us. <laughs> dining out, socializing. Many people don't yeah. understand what, what being Latin means in that sense. And um, For us, for both of you guys and us, Italians and Spanish especially, it's like we need it. We need the close contact with people because that makes us human in a way, right? Absolutely. And I miss having uh, wine served to me by a bartender as opposed to me serving my own. I absolutely agree about that. You know, I can keep pouring <laughs> wine to myself at home. But that thing that being with your wife sitting down and then asking you, which kind of wine do you want? White, red? You know that fits this meal. Just, just sure. that thing with them asking you what kind of wine. Because I don't ask myself what kind of wine I want to own. <laughs> I want somebody to ask me what do you want. You know what I mean? That is correct, and I agree. So it's just it's the social part of it that is it, it, make, it worries me. However, there are people in much more severe situations. Absolutely. I have friends that have lost businesses, and it breaks my heart. Yeah, it's yeah. it's sad. Yeah, but the, we can just hope you know things get better for everybody and. The, all the business are back and you know the government helps all that you know i still believe yes. in rainbows and unicorns you know <laughs> yes i agree it's a matter of time everything will work out over time unfortunately yeah. it might be a long time yes well let's hope it's not that long uh do you remember the last time you went to the theater to watch a movie uh, i spoke about that yesterday to my parents i don't remember the last time it's been many many years and so it wasn't because of covid 
uh-huh. uh, be, I, I just there are leaving to go to see a, a, a film that in a short time I can see on my large screen in my house mm-hmm. kind of took the, the impetus out. But I haven't been to a theater in years. Uh-huh. I was asking because uh, it's happening to many people in this in these chats where I asked them about the last movie they saw, they watched in the theater, even if it was in March. Um, nobody remembers, even myself, because Jakey asked me back, oh, you keep asking us. And I was like, I don't remember either. That's the thing. It's like we've moved to a different reality in a way. Do you feel that way? Like we, we yes, I do. And as a matter of fact, now films are being released simultaneously in theaters and streaming. And I feel that movie theaters might be might go by way of the dodo bird in a very short amount of time. And it'll just work that the movie companies will allow us access to their films at a certain cost without the need for a movie theater. Yeah. In a way, I saw that uh, AMC went to war. I don't know if you saw it. AMC went to war with Universal because not, that was, that. Uh, Universal released you know, the Trolls um, World Tour, the, the, the sequel, directly on BOD. Yes. Universal went crazy. Uh, so AMC went crazy. Says we are not going to release any any uh, Universal movies. The Universal said <clears throat> we have Bond, we have Jurassic World, we have Fast and Furious, we have blah 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 blah. This yes. year, you are going to do what? So, <laughs> so finally, AMC the bluff. They paid for it because now they have 15 days window only. When they have. Oh my goodness. So now, so now Universal is going to have those movies for two weekends make the money back because those are the weekends they need. And then they're going to say to AMC, you want to war? Yes. Lost. So, Understood. Because now they know with the experiment they did, as you were saying, you know, releasing the movies at the same time, they know they don't need the theaters that much, that they're going to make the money back, right? That's correct. And that's a shame. However, it's not as large a financial, uh, a business hit as you might think, because the, the theaters, how many people were employed by theaters over the last 10 years? It's not like it used to be. That's true. Uh, That's true. But I do miss, I miss specifically, I miss uh, drive-in movie theaters. Oh. It was oh. something very fond, I was very fond of as a child, and I haven't been to one in so long. I would go anywhere in a moment to go see a film at a drive-in movie theater. I miss it, just out of my heart, that's all. Yeah, there's a lot of people that have been telling me in other parts of the... <laughs> Other parts of the U.S. that movie the- that drive me movie theaters are coming back. It's not, not it's still so. not, it's still not in the state of New York. I don't know. I asked someone yesterday, and nobody seems to know. And I haven't even gone online to check, but I'm sure there are some. However, I, I don't see any near me, and I don't drive past any, so I assume that there are few and far between. Okay, well, th- th- that needs to come back, as you said. Probably one of the ways that uh, movie theaters are going to be saved. Is by the way of the driving because many people is so scared to go to a to a theater because of COVID and they're absolutely right to be scared. Uh, Agreed. Uh, Agreed. Some, sometimes you know driving theaters, but for, for, at least for a while probably could be the live server for theaters, right? I agree. I agree. Um, when you work, um, let me ask this: Do you work with music, silence, podcast, like a TV show in the back? something like that because i am like i am the fifth of five and in my house there's always noise so if you get the whatever noise the cacophony out i always feel like somebody's going to come behind my back you know and stop me <laughs> like <that's funny. laughs> because that's i need i need excellent. i need the noise so how is it for you that's an excellent excellent question i combine all the above music uh specifically for film not film tv or on my laptop comedy I love to hear laughter. Uh, I will go to sleep with either classical music or comedy in my headphones to fall asleep with a nice frame of mind hearing people laugh. But I will, I'm, I'm a blues fan. I listen to blues all the time. Love it. It's my favorite music. So I will sometimes just put blues on. Uh, I combine all the above. Um, I don't put film in unless it's a, a film that I'm familiar with and I don't have to turn to look at the at the, yes. the laptop. Yes. I, I need to be able to have the background, like you said, the noise behind me to make me feel comfortable and I'm able to work without paying attention to it. That's why I won't listen to news because it forces me to concentrate on the broadcast as opposed to what I'm working on. So it's a combination of music, comedy, film that I'm familiar with so I don't have to look at the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of the above, but excellent question. 
do you ever adapt? I mean, Olivier Coipel told me, uh, I loved I loved his answer on this because he told me that when he's doing layouts, since he needs, you know, precision to put everything in place, it's absolute silence. But then when he goes to pencils or, or inks or colors, because he colors his own covers, he always adapts the music to the scene he's drawing. Example, he needs epic. So he goes with, I don't know, the soundtrack of Last of the Mohicans or Lord of the Rings or Star Wars because it's like that puts me more inside the scene I want to draw and I think enhances my drawing. And when he Absolutely. wants emotional, he goes, you know, the other side. He goes to classical music like French romantics or something like that. Do you That's adapt point. to that or do you just go with the flow? Like, for example, just said you love blues. Do you just go with the blues and that's it? The overall, I will not have anything i won't have anything on that causes me to pay attention to it more than what i am working on the only moment the only time that i will have either silence or very quiet music is when i am uh storytelling or thumbnailing a script which needs complete concentration so that is correct and he is correct uh but it's 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 only a short amount of time it'll take me half a day uh and then i will put some music back on as i am laying out the work and so on However, it's a it's a combination of what I feel like that day and what music I am in the mood for. Uh, for instance, I will put on uh, 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 classical music sometimes. I'll put on Vienna, uh, Vienna's uh, 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 operas and and uh, uh, Strauss's waltzes because I think it's some of the most beautiful music ever created. Yep. And then a day, uh, an hour later, I want to hear rock and blues. Yeah. An hour after that, I want to hear laughter. So I, it changes as my emotions change during the day and sometimes affected by what I am working on. Yeah. I love it because it's the same for me. I, I am emotionally connected to music in that sense. My mood affects the music I'm listening to at any time I'm working because sometimes you just feel the music you're hearing doesn't fit with the emotion you feel right at that moment. So just... I think it's the same for you, right? Instinctually, you just, instinctually, you just change the music. You don't think I'm changing it because it's just your brain is asking for something else. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, the music, it just—it's it, an endorphin, if you know what I mean. It, it 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 enlightens me, especially blues, which is not known for being cheery sometimes because it's supposed to be about blue moments. But the music in the blues has me jumping. I'll be sitting in my chair and. All of a sudden, I want to hear the rest of the song. I'll rewind it and I'll sit there and I'll start bopping. I, I just adore it. And uh, it's you're right. It's correct. It, it's a, it's a, it depends on the moment mm -hmm. what I will put put in. And then with that, that continuing with that, something that I love to mention, and I don't know, I want to know if you agree, which is uh, I think symphonies and comics are very much related in the way of in the way they work. I think when you are, let me correct myself. Symphonies and storytelling. I think that storytelling is a symphony in a way where you're trying to tell a story that flows. And then Sequentially. You, Sequential. Yeah, yes. Exactly. And then to change the pace and go, you know, like uh, you said Strauss like, or Mozart or Bach, just the moment I want to point, bam, that's a, that's a splash page. Then in, and in music. I understand. I understand. So what the, do you problem think I have, the problem I have with classical when I'm working is it will sometimes draw me down so mellow that I'm not at my peak because I listen to, to uh, classical music to sleep at some points. If my wife is not able to sleep and she's listening to TV, watching TV, I will put in my noise canceling headphones and I'll have a Strauss waltz on and I'm, I'm asleep in a half hour and because that music is so beautiful. But while I'm working, it really depends. I, I, I can't do that and it'll, it'll calm me down and sometimes takes away my my most sharp moments the blues has me sharp mm -hmm. comedy has me sharp and, and it's background and it just gives me strength so it really depends on the, what i'm working on it really does if i'm working on a massive scene of battle and excitement i i need rock and blues in the room <laughs> you need that guitar to push you right yes, yes. eric so clapton eric clapton oh yeah oh, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Uh, so uh, we're, if we're talking about uh, comics, we're talking about the, langu the language. I always related to music and to science in many ways. But what is the storytelling for you? In your, in your, in your head of head, instinctually. Uh, I know it can be defined in a very precise way. But emotionally, for you, what is, what is storytelling? 
it's more important than the art because I'm, you'll have to excuse me for, for saying this, I'm not as good an artist as I want to be, but I am always excited about the storytelling because it improves my visuals. For instance, there are so many better draftsmen in this business than I am, but I have, uh, I have such a good time with the storytelling that I make sure everything connects and it flows. I hate gigantic gaps with no explanation. I don't like that in film. If there's a moment that doesn't have explanation to the next scene, it bothers me. Uh, so I, I, I'm lucky enough to have a father that helped me learn storytelling at a young age and not just in the business I'm in, but because we watched films as a young, as young children, my, my son, my brother and I, and my father would, instead of just sitting on a, on a rainy day with a movie on, he would tell us what's coming. You have to watch this and watch this scene. We love film noir, black and white films. Mm -hmm. And he would tell us, pay attention to what's coming up because this is about to happen and you won't believe. And it got us all excited about what we were about to see. So we loved black and white movies as youngsters. And it allowed us to enjoy film noir, it allowed us to, to enjoy storytelling. And then when excitement in film came about, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the special effects and, and so on, it's not that it took away from it, but it was important that there was still the storytelling involved in those films. And it not always was. For instance, my, one of the greatest movies I've ever seen, I, I, not the greatest movie I've ever seen, but the greatest storytelling movie I've ever seen is On the Waterfront. Mm -hmm. 55 or 59. And uh, 12 Angry Men, a movie just about jurors in you know, at yeah, the talk, really. and, but, it's, but it's beautiful storytelling. So uh, those films allow me to enjoy the knockdown, drag out, fun special effects, pop corn movies, if there's storytelling involved. Now, what that did with my father is that when I joined the business, so to speak, I saw the combination and the confluence of the need for sequential storytelling. And I was given advice by a few uh, uh, editors, including Jim Shooter, a good man, uh, who said, you need to establish every few pages, if not every two pages, establish where everyone is and where you are so that it, there's no mystery about it. And even, and I learned not even to make a gigantic image of the establishing shot, but make sure that it connects to the, the establishing shot of the previous um, sequence. So it, it, it combined everything to me, the storytelling, the sequential storytelling and film and storytelling in film. And it, it became a, a bright bulb in my head. It blew up. I, I, I understand this. Then the art needs to come to follow. But my storytelling is better than my art by far. And it improves my art because I love to do scenes that some people don't do. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to cheat. I don't like to, to avoid if there is a scene with 200 people in, a, in a, uh, a boardroom sitting and talking and each head has to be in a certain, I have to make sure that everyone speaks left to right and people, unless we're in Japan or then we have to go right to left, but where, where everybody speaks and it makes sense if the next panel people are arranged. I take great pains in making sure everything makes sense and everyone speaks in proper order and that there are images in the storytelling that are not boring. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I, I love storytelling. I love it more than the art, but the art is integral to it. Yes. Uh, just a side note, I have Phil Jimenez. Uh, Phil Jimenez, so however you pronounce it, <laughs> Phil Jimenez on, on Friday here. And I, when I told him you were coming today, he literally said, please tell John he's the best storyteller in comics. Oh, that is such a great compliment. Thank and you. I agree with him, by the way. But, you know, Thank you. I don't Thank think you. your art is worse than your storytelling. That you say. <laughs> it's your art, so you can say it. But I think you are the best storyteller in comics, and many people can, most people could learn from you. Um, I know, listen, we sit, at a, we sit at a tavern together with some drinks. I can tell you great stories. Oh, yes. <laughs> but not here. <laughs> not here. So, and, um, the, what you said about your, your dad and the movies, I love it because that means John Sr. is not one of the best ever because he is one of the best ever. For me, top three worldwide globally ever in comics Thank you. Thank um it also means that he loved to be a storyteller he did not even watching not even about the movie but 
to make you guys love stories more, telling you in advance what was going to happen, to involve you in stories. So now imagine somebody at that age. At that age, there was no TV to to fall back on, no streaming. He went to to see films. He's a cinephile, and I'll give you an example. And one anecdote is that we went to go see a film called The Big Country mm -hmm. with Charlton Heston, and it was important that he said to me, "Watch this scene as there is this gigantic vista of the countryside." And there is a, a battle going on, a fight. I think it was a fist fight between Charlton Heston and someone else. And it was these muted sounds of the punches. And then it closed in on the fist fight. And he said, watch this and use it. And he's right. It was called Big Country. So the screen was gigantic. But the fight was so specific. So the director closed in on the fight from the large scene. That to me is a storytelling genius. And I've, you, I've stolen it and used it a billion times, but my father knew this and said, you gotta watch this. It's so cool, I love that. That's amazing, I, the, I, I guess that, this is a two way question. When um, for you starting in comics was just natural, it was just an evolution of seeing your dad doing it, or it was, or you went around and it's like, yeah, I don't wanna do what my dad did. You know, I see him every day at every hour, you know, a slave in a slave by his desk and all that. I, I was not so, good. You know, a, a time later, you realize, you know what? I actually want to do it. I, I I was not lucky enough to inherit my my father's talent. Man is brilliant and always has been. I had to learn to get to be a good artist, and I still am learning. That's the good thing. Uh, another thing from my father is the lack of ego, and. Uh, he said, make sure that you have your feet on the ground because there's always somebody bigger, better, stronger, smarter, better looking. All right, not so better looking, but anyway, bigger, better, stronger, yeah, smarter, and a better artist than you. When you deal with the fact that there's somebody better than you all the time, you always strive to improve. Mm -hmm. That's the case with my art. I have so many contemporaries that are better than me. But I didn't learn to draw from my father. I learned how to learn. And he uh, didn't want me to feel forced to get into the the art field, but I loved art because I watched him. I just never was as good as he is. So he did not frustrate me in what he said. He just said, you just watch and you learn and then I'll teach you how to learn. This is what you should pay attention to. This is what you should look at. This is what you should, and get a damn education. So it was a confluence of things. And I know I'm not as good an artist because he's a fine artist and I am a cartoonist, even though I was trained in fine arts, I'm a cartoonist. The man is a brilliant illustrator. I'll give you a sports. I, if, if I was, uh, if my father, my father was Lionel Messi, Lionel Messi, and I am the backup midfielder in Barcelona. That's the, that's the the chasm between the two of us. Okay, I'm going to tell you another example, uh, another comparison of of guys that I think that resemble even more your dad and yourself. I think your father is Michael Jordan. I was going to use that example. And, and you and you are international audience. And you are and you are LeBron James. Oh, I was going to say my father's Michael Jordan, and I'm the sixth man at the end of the bench. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. I, I, when I was growing up, that's the way I looked at my father as an artist. And uh, he he said something once, not that long ago. He said, "I I acknowledge that I'm a, a better overall artist than my son." He's right. But I, he said, my son is a better cartoonist than me by far. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how true that is, but that's the way he put it. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a nice combination of the two. He's a brilliant artist. He paints. He did paintings when he was 19 that I cannot do right now. Yeah. He did uh, recruiting posters for the Women's Army Corps in the 50s for the military. He did it at age 19. I can't do that right now. That's how brilliant the man was. Yeah. He did I, illustrations. He did paintings of his great grandmother. He did paintings of his grandmother. Brilliance beyond brilliance. He's got. I have a portfolio of his charcoal sketches. And he would go to Bryant Park in New York City at lunchtime from school, school when he was sixteen with a pad, and sketch the people in the park. I have them. I can't do those now. He was sixteen. So. He he said he said it right. He's a better artist than I am overall. He said I'm a better cartoonist. I think if he were younger, he would still be crushing it.
<laughs> Probably. I, I that reminded me of when I told people about your dad and John Buscema being painters, and people were yes. like, "No, I don't believe it. I never saw that." Like you should, because it would blow your head off. You know, they're, they're, right. they're not only amazing comic artists; they were incredible. They are, well, in, in in Big John's case, incredible painters, right? There's yeah. there's a lot of in the in the background in of of the guys of uh, your dad and John and John Buscema generation. Interestingly, enough, a guy like Jack. Jack Kirby wasn't a painter, but he was a brilliant cartoonist. Yeah, yeah. So the, there's a, there's always some kind of distinction. There are other artists, Joe Jusco and, uh, and many other painters that are great painters, but they can't tell a story. Yes, they have yeah. trouble with sequential storytelling. Yeah, and that's the, that. What I think made a special John B, your father, and some others that they could jump in both directions seamlessly, and show that they could be amazing storytellers. They could tell Roman stories. They can tell monster stories. They could tell whatever that is, was in front of them. I still think your father is the best romance comics artist in the history of, of the world. I know there's a gentleman named Rest in Peace named Leonard Starr. Okay. Uh, that did uh, did uh, beautiful work in the newspaper strips way back in the day. Uh, but I appreciate that, and I think he would appreciate that. And he cut his teeth on romance comics mm -hmm. before he got back with Stan. So. Yep. Uh, the the work was beautiful. It was. Yeah. Uh, what is for you? What makes the comics language show special, and, or or did you prefer the word unique in comparison to the language in movies or or any uh, illustration or anything else? You know, in terms of sequentiality, we're talking about the storytelling. But what do you think makes us so different in terms of the other languages? I don't know if it's different. I think. Uh, Graphic novels, comic books, are stop-action film, and when they become, when they came up alongside each other, I forgot how many decades ago when Steven Spielberg realized it or George Lucas realized it, they had grown in comics, and they became brilliant movie makers and realized that storytelling and and the uh, they would do their own storytelling before that they would film yeah. uh, storyboards. So yeah. it, when it came up alongside each other, it became apparent that comic books are stop action films. Now, I, I think that they are vital to helping young people learn to read. And I'll tell you why. My middle son, when he was a younger guy, struggled with his reading skills. When he was handed a comic book by my wife, he suddenly started to equate images with the words and remember stan lee was doing uh scripts with large difficult words that we all would go to a dictionary when we read comics he would never write down to people yes he would make sure you had to reach for it so my my middle son learned to read and now he's a he's a com computer genius computer science it helped he said yeah of course it helped i had images to connect to the words and uh, it made it fun so i think that's part of it I think it should be part of, of a young person's life. I don't mean in, in, a, in instead of education, but it should be part of education. And I don't mean technically with schools, but offer it up as, instead of derisively looking at it as something for children, show people that you can learn to read and enhance your, think about the words that Stan Lee would come up and, and would type into scripts when we were younger. Yeah. I have, a, I have a decent vocabulary because of that man and my father. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's also another part that I love about what you just said, which is I think uh, reading comic books make, gives us a, a superpower. And let me and let me let me explain. One, the first thing we learn as comic book readers is to read between what happens between the panels, in the gutters. We go from Superman doing this. To Superman already flying, but when you are watching Christopher Reeve or Henry Cavill, you have to watch the whole sequence when he opens, moves, and flies. So we teach from a very young age to look at what we don't see, to interpret. So that's why I say when comic readers start reading something else, novels, newspapers, etc., we are the people that always know to look be to read between the lines. That's well put. That's very well put, and I appreciate that. And it does come to storytelling, which I mentioned before, that I hate large gaps. However, you can have a small gap as long as it makes sense as you flow through the whole scene. 
And uh, uh, it, it's vital that now film is easy because it, it it's right there in front of you, but it's not a, it's a challenge with our business. Yep. And I defy anybody to learn that part. For instance, when young people say to me, what can I do to be a better artist? I said, well, you can just uh, use uh, 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 photographs, uh, imagery, books online, look at it, learn and teach yourself or get education, anatomy. However, you want to get into this business, you have to also make a gigantic step in storytelling, sequential art. Oh, well, that's, you know, I'll get, I'll learn that. No, you won't, because it's been around since the Renaissance. Yeah. Go to, to the Louvre, and there are beautiful paintings, and along the bottom are five or six panels related to a Renaissance painting. And I remember getting to the Louvre with my wife and saying, oh, my God, sequential art from 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And it's part and parcel. We can't keep uh, an image on its own and stare at it for too long without having something connected to it, as you said. A gap in in a film can be fixed, but in our business we have to explain. Yeah, and there's stories behind every painting, and it basically think about it: storytelling behind uh, the the Virgin Mary's images, stories behind every fine painting that the painter was talking about. The Statue of David, my God, it nearly moves if you stare at it. Yes, there's always something with it. It's not just. That's why I don't like paintings of countrysides yeah i find them boring i'm yeah. sorry i find them boring no no i i it happens to me the same way except with the impressionists because yes the impressionists are done in a way that remember go farther go closer it seems yes. that it's completely different and it's telling you a different story you have to take a distance and then depending on the way you look i remember monet um yes. before i watch a monet painting live you know in uh, in, in in paris in the fuck no not louver the other museum so i just blank um <laughs> Jus de pomme. what Jus de pomme? yeah yeah probably so i was there and i remember before that every time i see a, i saw a painting or a, or a van gogh i was okay. like yeah yeah you know, okay but then the moment you are in front of one in person and you start yes. realizing what they did with the brushes and you take a distance and start or you squint your or you squint your eyes exactly exactly and you are like oh my god it's, yes. it's what you say it becomes alive at that moment and becomes more than what it is I, I i agree completely and i tell people that when i become a painter again when i retire from deadline work i want to be an impressionist because it's what i need to counter 40 years of realism which yeah uh, <laughs> you're going going to want to be an impressionist you're, you're going to go through your uh, blue, yellow, whatever, your Picasso period. <laughs> you're just going to say, I don't know what, you know, I've been doing this for 50 years. Fuck it. I'm not just going to pay for painting blue. And I don't care. And if you don't like it, suck it. <laughs> because I've been doing it for 50 years. <laughs> yes. So, but uh, another thing uh, that I love about what you mentioned, that seems something that was a storytelling two years ago, 2000 years ago, I could go even further. For me, storytelling starts on the caves. You know, you're talking about Altamira, we're talking about Lascaux, and suddenly you see a guy on a wall, you know, on a, on a cave, on a stone. You see that he has four legs, or you see that the same guy is uh, shooting six arrows at the same time. That's them telling you a story. That's them telling you his guy is running. How do yes, we they, they draw That's four correct. legs? How can they show you he's uh, shooting a lot of arrows to, to catch that animal? Six arrows at the same time. So it's, it's storytelling, I think, is basic for us. And another thing that I'm going to ask you is if, if you agree is many times I see that creators, some creators, in many cases, it's amazing because they're very good at being Baroque. But in other cases, they put too much stuff. And, yes. uh, and I go back and, and ask them, do you know what pattern recognition is? I'm sorry, say that again? And I, many times when those creators, especially young people, I tell them, do you know what pattern recognition is? And they are like this blank, and it's like you don't have to draw it all. When we were <laughs> in the caves, in the case that many years ago, three thousand, four thousand years ago, you heard a bush rustle be behind you, and you jump and hide because you said, "Shit, there's yes. an animal there. It's gonna kill me." So, and I think that pattern recognition is a big time. It's a big part of uh, comics story. Sure, sure, sure. Because you have to know when less is more, right? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. And that is such an important part of it. That, that's why painter, painters who are just painting a portrait 
for instance, uh, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. I, I would love to know that there is that one woman, but I don't think there is. But that smirk, that smile, there's so much more to it. That's it, it makes the, 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 the painting so full of depth. So it's the same concept that a painter that just paints a countryside to me is just going for a walk and it's boring. But somebody who adds, for instance, that's what impressionism is. Mm -hmm. And I, expressionism, impressionism, Moet, Mo, Monet and, and Manet, uh, uh, the YFs, uh, I love there's depth to it aside from the realism. Yeah. Uh, that I, I can't see a flat painting without something involved in it. I don't mean a theme. For instance, go to a, a gallery or a, or a museum and there are people walking around. Oh, mm, oh mm, look at the meaning box. They don't know what they're talking about. Yes. <laughs> they just think it's, it means that the painter had something in their mind. Perhaps. But what I need is when I see the painting for what it is, that it actually had more to it than just the painting on the brush. That's where the Mona Lisa comes in. That's where the Statue of David comes in. You know what was going on. Uh, yep. That that, for instance, the stories about the Statue of David actually moving when there are janitors moving around, and that the statue actually moves at some point. Hold on one second, David. Yes. I do have your phone. Yes. I will when I'm done with David. David, say hi to Kathy. Kathy, say hi to David. Hello. <laughs> uh, that 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 statue. That's the only man-made thing that makes me cry when I see it. I got to see it in person in in the Uffizi Palace in Florence, and I, it's it is emotionally generating. I, I cannot believe that this is done by a human being. Yeah. Mona Lisa was the same way. Paintings that that, that you know that there's just, and I don't mean the theme. I don't mean that there's symbolism to it. I mean that the painter saying, oh, I'm going to paint the Mona Lisa with that smirk. And I want people to question it in 2000 years. Yep. That's what we're doing. That to me is movement in a painting. Yep. Uh, the same with the expressionism, impressionism, the same thing. It's not realism, but there's something to it that gives. Oh, yeah, and as I said, no. the Mona Lisa, as you said, with the statue of David, I can tell you about many people who says that the Mona Lisa is looking at them. Yeah. Okay. Your eyes have moved. You know that impression that. Right. You know, that's not a painting. See, it's actually looking at me. And I, many people say that is, and I, I agree with you about the model. I don't think there's a model. I think it's Da Vinci, getting from a lot of different women until he got that special, real in a way woman. Yes. That you don't, you can't never know if it really existed or not. He was all about proportion. Remember. So. Agreed. Agreed. So, but that's like, smart. That slight smile when Da Vinci did that, do you really think he just accidentally put that smirk on her face? So th th this is what I'm talking about. And the same thing with the, with the Statue of David. It's, it's beyond incredible that yeah. without them trying to give us any symbolism or pretense, yes. there was depth and brilliance to it without a message. I don't need a message. David, he slew Goliath and he has his sling over his shoulder. And it's the epitome of man. But this was chiseled. Do you know what he said, Michelangelo? I just chiseled everything away that it wasn't David. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Really? Did you really? Oh, my God. <laughs> but, that, but that's the same thing that uh, if you ever, once uh, in the future somewhere, you're able to, to come to Spain to a show. Uh, I just want you to go to uh, the Reina Sofia just to watch the Guernica, Picasso's Guernica in person. Okay. Is, is the the scariest painting I've seen in my life. <laughs> it's not realistic at all, but when you get in, you just get afraid, scared, because Understood. of what happened. And it's not portraying reality at all. He's not telling you that this is, you know, the planes, the, the Nazis were testing the planes and Franco led them, you know, yes. Yes. It, and they kill a lot of people. There's no realism at all. But all the emotional intention to scare you is there. And it's there. Absolutely. It's just overwhelming, as you just said. It doesn't need to be realistic. It just needs to tell you a story, right? Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. This subtle storytelling in the greatest paintings without trying to give you a symbolism message. That's what bothers me about people that go to, oh, my, oh, oh, look what he was trying to say. And I'll listen to a, a curator. 
that will do a tour and I'll hear the garbage that comes out of the curator's mouth without ever knowing the painter. They just read a couple of comments and say, this is what this painter was trying to say. How the hell do you know what the painter was trying to say? Because you read it? Don't give me that. It's a yeah. beautiful piece of art. And look at the cleverness of this color next to that color. Look at the brilliance of the grin on Mona Lisa's face. Do you really think there's symbolism in that? No, it's just brilliance, sheer brilliance and depth. And that's what, uh, that's why when people, uh, they don't pass over Renaissance paintings. Yeah. They, they, they ignore them as great works of art. They only think they're great because they're old. That's not true. You have to look at some of these things and look what's in, look what the painter did in that little section over here. You think that's symbolism? No, that's just, that's trying to get people to look at that corner of the painting. Mm -hmm. You look at it, I look at the smile on Mona Lisa and I want to meet that woman or the women that it was based on. I want to ask Da Vinci what he had in mind. Mm -hmm. When I die, if I decide to die, I'm going to walk up to him and ask him what he was doing. Yeah, but you have to make that decision. Just, you know. yes. uh, <laughs> I, I love that what you just said because once I remember um, in Madrid, in, in uh, Prado, you know, of course you have the amazing Velázquez paintings, Goya, blah, blah, blah. Uh, of course, it was Ladies in Waiting, which the most famous or almost most famous in, uh, from Velázquez. And there was a creator, as you just said, you know, telling the story, blah, 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 why he created, making a full story that was, I was listening to it like, that's such bullshit. And my wife, <laughs> and my wife said from behind me, just, you know, just so I listened to it. So I heard this like, you know why he did it? And I was like, why? Like, he was a royal painter. He had to do it. He was paid for it. Then I was like, Okay, that's true. There's no bush around. He was the royal painter. They told him to paint the ladies in waiting with the with the queens with the infant queens, and he did that. That then we can discuss how he did it. You know the yes. way he did it and the story he wanted to tell. But yes. sometimes the reason is that's your job and you get paid for it. Amen. So um, another thing about the the, the comics language that I don't want to to forget. Do you think the the control the control of time and space we have in comics? Uh, in control of time, I mean, yes, guys, I'm gonna say it. I always say the same thing, and people think I'm joking, and I don't. I think comics is the only art that can defy Einstein theory of relativity. <laughs> because we control oh. time, we control time and space in a way that no other art can. You well, can have, film, filmmakers do the same. No, because films you can you cannot let me explain in films the movie is going to continue whether you lose or not okay in fair a, enough in a novel whether you like it or not in comics you can just say panel one page one to panel five page 20 it happens at the same second all right and you can control the size of the panel and the shape and you're going to say i'm slowing i'm going faster so every time every decision you make as, a, as an artist determines how the reader reads it. I, I, I would love to read. I would love to read that next time somebody speaks about the theory of relativity. Oh, by the way, comics defies the theory. I love that. That's that is just charming as hell. Love it. <laughs> I'm sorry first about time that. I've heard it. That's the first time I've heard it, and I'm never going to forget it. That's brilliant. I'm sorry about it, but I, it's the, it's the, for me, it's the easiest way to explain what I mean. You know, <laughs> the theory of relativity says the arrow of time always goes in that direction. You have to follow it. Movies go in that direction. Yeah. Literature going to send like the direction. Theater goes in that direction. Comics doesn't have to. Understood. Comic, comic can say, yes, I'm going here, but suddenly, and I always put the same example, Watchmen, page one, page five, issue one. You have Laurie in the background. Issue five, you have Laurie in the, in the foreground, and without a word, they're telling you this is happening exactly at the same time. Five issues. That's brilliant. I understand, and I agree with you. I hadn't thought of it until you mentioned it, but that's that's... That's excellent. That's excellent. Nice. See, you learn something from everybody sometime. I love it. I love uh, for, it. Never you, heard those terms put together. I love it. For you, it's for you. It's just it's just natural. I mean, when you're thinking about uh, about the pacing, do you consciously think I want to slow things down here, or it just comes automatically out of you know so many times doing it? Uh, the story already tells you. What the, what the speed needs to? A little bit of both, and I'll explain. There are moments, there are scenes where I think it should be drawn out with close-ups, uh, facial close-ups, and that can't be done regularly, but there are moments, there's a vignette when there's a conversation going on, and it should just be 
uh, 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 expressions. For instance, I, the the uh, the Batman uh, I did in pencil um, with Frank Miller. There's a, a page of the Joker who's just hanging out. He's smoking a cigarette, and we follow his face throughout the nine-panel grid. Just before there's a big fight in the in the crate in uh, uh, the insane asylum. Uh, uh, can't think of the come. name of it now. I come. Uh, right. And and th that's a specific slowdown, uh, whereas comics do get uh, mad paced at sometimes. But we do slow down, and I do make a concerted effort sometimes. But it really is specific when it hits me. For instance, a, a, a writer will send me uh, a plot, and two pe two sentences could turn into ten pages, whereas two pages of manuscript can turn into one panel. Mm -hmm. It really depends on the substance. And the writers that I've worked with, Brian, Brian Bendis recently on action, Frank Miller, uh, Mark Miller, uh, I've worked with some of the great writers. I got a chance to work with Neil Gaiman, who gave me latitude on the Eternals. That was the greatest compliment ever. And he says, I know what you can do here. I'm going to send you the script. But don't consider it a script. Call it a plot. And you do whatever you want with it. And I will change the dialogue according to the artwork. That's Neil Gaiman. Greatest compliment ever. So it really depends on the writer. What Frank Miller gave me 15 pages of script, and I gave 200 pages of artwork into Superman Year One, because as I said, a sentence could be 10 pages of artwork, just because it gets you that mindset. And I, I know what I can do with this. I can play with this. It really depends, but it's a it's a great question. And I don't mean to rush you, but in 10 minutes, do you mind if I become a husband again and a father? I have to run. Oh, so let me get okay. Uh, let me get. We want, did you want more than an hour? I don't know because suddenly time is of the essence. I I just been. Yeah, I, want, it I wanted to do more than an hour because at, at the right. at the hours when I start, you know, asking questions from the fans. But if you okay. have to leave, you have to leave. That's it. <laughs> can, no, I can stretch it. Can we do another half hour from here? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right, let's it? go. I will I'll try to. If you give me a moment, I have to make one quick delivery, oh, and well. I'll be back in ten seconds. Yes, go. Guys, uh, as you can see, okay, well, now this, I don't know if we have to cut it short. He just told me, but uh, I will change uh, and go with uh, with your questions now, okay? And I try to get um, as many as I can. Now you become the priority, okay? I don't want this to happen like it happened with uh, with Phil, okay? So as soon as he comes back, uh, we'll start with your questions. And maybe someday we can do a part two or something like that all right i'm sorry david no worry about that i've done my my husbandly duties nah uh, so obligation obligation first and then devotion don't worry about this all right and obligation is family first you know yes. uh, in my case i just heard you know wife and kid that just just came home they're fine all and right. the here the six-year-old oh that's when he said okay I gotta go. <laughs> okay so let's go with the guys then uh, uh I'm sorry they know, so I'm not going to rush so they don't get out. Uh, David Da Silva says, oh, yes. Gonzalo Araya, hola a todos. Felipe Brel, hello, everyone. Uh, I couldn't miss this. Rita Carambola says, Doc Frank Howard says, oh, my God, John Romita Jr. Rita Carambola says, ah, she's happy. <laughs> uh, Felipe Gonzalo Araya says, it's a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Romita. Uh, my pleasure. Felipe Gonzalo Araya says, I remember the first time I read your work. It was their devil. How do you remember your one under Devil uh, and working with Annie Nocenti? I remember it fondly because I, I knew uh, I knew Anne from she was an editor on the the book uh, before we started working together, so I knew her from the office. Uh, she she allowed me much the same that Frank Miller does when we work together. She allowed me to do the storytelling and the story and the and the uh, pacing myself, and then she would add her dialogue to it. She was very underappreciated writer she's she's she was a great writer i currently she's doing beautiful work i haven't seen it i, I i've got to read it it was a pleasure she was a good friend and a good lady and a great great writer mm -hmm. i remember let it me, fondly we did some great things while we were working together let me show you one thing oh my god <laughs> this is Al this, this, this Al is Al hanging, Williamson. yes this is hanging on my wall Oh, thank that. you so much. See, there's that center page, the center panel. I mean, no, no, uh, no cheating. There's look at that. There's too many figures in there. Yes, yes. So you see, Al Williamson. Oh my goodness, Al Williamson. Fantastic yes. stuff. 
I had a pleasure of working with a brilliant illustrator. It was fantastic. That's that, uh, one of the best also, an amazing artist. And with you, it was magic. I think that you guys together were magic, literally. That, the, the Daredevil Man Without Fear with Frank, I can still consider it one of the best projects I ever worked on and the best work I've done because it was a combination of, of everything, the art with Al Williamson and uh, and the storytelling with Frank. I think it's, it's as good as, if not better than anything I've ever done. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I would discuss that, but it was amazing. You know, you, uh, I think that your level is so high that we can talk about many things like like your best. And not All many right. artists can say that. So that's a big you. compliment. Uh, you. Like Rayval says, John, thank you. You're my favorite artist of all time. Uh, what was your favorite thing about working with Neil Gaiman? Working with whom? Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman. I, I mentioned it a few moments ago. The, the, the biggest compliment I've ever gotten from somebody of that stature was what he said about the storytelling. Uh, first, we both agreed that we were going to take reference to Jack Kirby's Eternals, the, the, the images. And I was able to put up all sorts of images of uh, the characters from Jack Kirby's version. But when he said to me, I think... I, I'm familiar with what you can do as a storyteller, and I want you to feel free to do whatever you want with the script. Don't consider it a script. And then I'll change the dialogue. Let me know what you have in mind if you're going to change anything significant. And I would contact him, and we would talk. And we got to be friends because of the project, and that was the greatest, possibly the best compliment I've ever gotten from an associate ever. Okay. Uh, Gabriel Hernandez Walta, amazing artist. Hello, Gabriel. How are you? Such a pleasure to hear and watch Master Rom uh, Romita Jr. I always read a comic drawn by you whenever I feel tired and need some extra energy to do my own stuff. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing compliment, just so you know. I, I, that is a great compliment. I substitute it for coffee. That's wonderful. That Yeah, you're, you're Gabriel's caffeine. <laughs> That's right. John Romita Caffeine Jr. Um, okay, can you give me some? I need your caffeine too. No. <laughs> uh, Rita Caramola says you're run in... Uh, Uncanny X-Men is my favorite X run of all times, together with the issues that Paul Smith they, uh, did uh, right before you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. you achieve to uh, develop a strong uh, human stories and, uh, and give a lot of complexity and make them make the characters real person, real people. That's wonderful. That's, I, that's actually, I get, occasionally, I will get a compliment from somebody comes up in a, in a convention and we'll say something to the effect of, I enjoy your background characters. For instance, when I do a scene in a bar in, in, in New York City, I throw my friends in the backgrounds. I use my friend's tavern. Uh, uh, I use scenes where there's every color and every gender and everything you can imagine thrown into it because that's what the area, that's what New York City is like to me. It's, it's, it's a gigantic hybrid of every part of the society. So when I use a background, I'll throw in every character you can imagine, friends of mine, and I'll have somebody come up. To, and I don't, I'm not consciously doing it to get people to make it, not make a comment, but I'll get somebody coming up to me and say, you know, I, I pay attention to the backgrounds of your characters, and I really enjoy the fact that you add color to your color, quote, unquote, um, especially in these times uh, when somebody pays me a compliment that way because I grew up in a multicultural neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I saw. Like we would play sports in the playground and there were more people of color than there were white people. That's the way I grew. We understood that. So yeah. it was part of my art. Mm -hmm. And I, I enjoy that so much. Okay. Uh, John B says, JR, JR, you're a legend. Yes, please. Not, <laughs> reality, but not, reality. You are. Uh, not, not in my not in my own mind, no. It's okay, but in mine you are. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> how were your um, see you, the key, I think you already answered, you already answered this. Uh, how did you feel working on Man with Earth without fear with Frank? It's my favorite work of yours. I think you just answered. That it. is a great compliment. It just uh, it be, it became something to me that I didn't think I could reach, which was the combination of the art and the storytelling mm -hmm. and the film story. It was a film. It was a, a, either a TV treatment or a film treatment that Frank couldn't get past, and then he handed it to me in its rarest, in its uh, in, in its platform, yeah. and allowed me to play with it. And then in the middle of it, he said, uh, oh, by the way, I have an addendum I'm going to throw in between page 17 and 18. It was a 64-page graphic novel plan, and before I was finished, he said, between page 17 and 18, there's this scene I want to add. 
88 pages of addendum was added to it, and it became a 144-page graphic novel. Uh, <laughs> that's a great compliment, and I, I myself agree. It's one of my, my favorite, if not the best, I've ever worked on. That's just a small gap. You know, like, eight, let's have 88 pages. <laughs> I can imagine, frankly. <laughs> but to me, to me, Frank's plots, Frank's stories are as good as it gets in our business. Yes. That's all yes. there is to it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Rita Carambola says, you, you Uncanny X-Men, the cover for Uncanny X-Men 210, that of Come On, Mess With Us, uh, Make Our Day, is also my favorite X cover ever. Oh, that, thank you so much. That is a great, great compliment. Thank you. Wow. Uh, the Javier Meson oh. says, John, John Romita Jr. is one of the great masters of the ninth art. Very exciting uh, that you are in this channel. My question, uh -huh. will he come back to Marvel one day? I would love to see him return to Spider-Man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I never say never, but uh, right now I'm, I'm with DC. Uh, I, I won't say anything to, to, to get my foot out of my mouth. I, I have to keep my mouth shut because I'm a freelancer. And if something were to happen in when this COVID thing passes, who knows? I, I don't have any uh, false notions that I need to do anything with anybody for any reason other than need and filling the need. If they if they feel it necessary to con contact me, I'll talk to them. I would love to. I would love to do Spider-Man again, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to do Wonder Woman, so we're even. Ah, oh, Wonder Woman. Mm, interesting. That's really interesting. Okay. See, I have a Wonder Woman that I live with, so I want to draw the character. Uh, yeah, I have two here, so I agree. I, I want to see that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Uncanny X-Men with Claremont. John B. says, Uncanny X-Men with Claremont. Didi with Nocenti and Miller. Too many great comics by John Romita Jr. to mention. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's Robert so nice. Says, Which Frank Miller comic art has influenced you the most, if any? Frank Miller's art or, or books? Art, his art. He said art. Uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> His Daredevil and then his work on, on Dark Knight. I think everybody universally agrees about Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. But again, Frank's art was secondary to his storytelling. Yes. He, had a great, he has a great style. It's different. It's not so perfectly realistic, but it's, it's a caricature. It's, it's uh, uh, stylized uh, the way J Jack Kirby's art was stylized. But Frank's storytelling, cinematic, brilliant, yeah. brilliant. So I would say... Uh, Daredevil and and uh, and uh, Dark Knight. Okay, I I thought you were gonna say like, Daredevil Man Without Fear. That's the one that influenced me. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that I was I thought you were gonna mention Electro Lives again. That's uh, all right, all right. Yeah. That's also quality. All right, fair enough. Because that's the one I think changed changed mm -hmm. it all for him uh, as a storyteller. I agree. Artist. I agree with that. Because that's and I can't he, take away from Klaus Miller. Klaus, excuse me, Klaus Jansen working on oh, Frank's work. Uh, they. Uh, uh, David, uh, oh my God, on the Daredevil. Oh, the Italian guy, I can't remember his name. Oh my God, I'm blanking. Patrick Kelly. David, yeah. Brilliant stuff. Uh, so the Daredevil and the Man Without, and excuse me, Daredevil and the uh, and the, the, the Dark Knight stuff, just universally beautiful. I'm man, I'm man without fear is the best. We just said that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Felipe Gonzalez says, "It was your pencils with uh, the evolution on your on your pencils, uh, a conscien uh, conscious decision, or it was an experiment amo among the years trying to find, uh, during the years, I mean, trying to find your own voice and style. I have watched your evolution during forty years. Uh, your evolution have have same stuff during the last four years. That's a that's a great question and point. The interesting part of it is it was never a concerted effort." <clears throat> to change the art until I tried, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, <clears throat> add bulk to the characters. I made a blocky character. It was a short amount of time, but then I was able to morph it into uh, a better image. Uh, when I was given the chance to work on Daredevil and have storytelling input and complete pencils, tight pencils, I was young at the time. When I was given that latitude, Things changed, and then the storytelling improved. Uh, but the I never made a concerted effort to do a, make a style look a certain way. All I was trying to do was get it out on time and make it look, uh, make it a good story. And it mm -hmm. happened on its own. But the period of time when I was told to 
I needed weight and, and, and sides and three dimensions to each character. I got carried away with the blocky look. Mm-hmm. And that was a brief amount of time, but then I was able to keep it and then smooth it out and make it look a little more realistic. That was the only time, and I wasn't happy with it because it looked too blocky. Yeah. And I would get told that regularly. This looks terrible. It's blocky. It's a piece of shit. And I would say, Mom, calm down. It's not that bad. <laughs> okay. John I'm B- joking. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, John B. says, uh, John Romita, JR's Punisher work also rocks. I would love to see him uh, doing Punisher with Carl Tennis. Who knows? Oh, Feature. boy. As I said, that would be amazing. That, as we said, who knows? Feature. I would love to work with God. I got a chance to do Punisher with Chuck Dixon. That was wonderful too. That wasn't bad either. I love, I love that Punisher World Journal stories. Uh, Hi, Master. Robotman says, Hi, Master. Jr. Jr. I have a question on the man without fears. Oh, uh, you already answered this. If you work with a loose script, or or Miller instructed you with the panel, you will have to do with the panels. No, yeah. give it latitude. Give him complete latitude. It was wonderful. This is a Blade Ray Man. 15 minutes, I'm going to have to run. I apologize. Don't worry. I'm not forgetting the time image you said. Don't worry about it. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. At the watch, at the clock. So I'll that explain, it a le- I'll explain right. another time, David, to you what is going on. It's interesting. Okay. I'll, I will just, that's why I'm going so fast with the questions. Okay. Uh, Blake Ray Man says, what do you think made Al Williamson such a great thinker? I love your, your work together. I think Al Williamson was a great inker because he was a brilliant artist in general. That's what Klaus Janssen, Scott Hanna, they are brilliant artists to begin with, and they talented with their, their line strokes. Al Williamson was a brilliant illustrator. That's all there is to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robotman, also the doubles, page, doubles plus page where Matt Murdock and Stick are jumping over the city is my favorite double plus, is a doubles plus page of all time. You have Thank become you. a saint to me. Because of that page, love you so much, Saint Thank Romita. You. Thank <laughs> you, thank you, Saint Caffeine Romita Junior. That's wonderful. Oh, that's you're adding your, you're adding, yes, Saint Caffeine. Okay, <laughs> we want more, guys. We want more uh, to add it to his name, Francisco Sanchez. Uh, how did you get a question that probably you get you have been uh, you have answered a million times? How did you get your first work at Marvel? I believe it was some pages in a Spider-Man annual. He says. Uh, no, uh, the first work I did at Marvel was working as a uh, sketch uh, designer for, uh, for covers and splash pages when Marvel would print their, uh, the, British divi- the British version in two halves. So I would work in a, the department of Marvel where I would do a sketch, a cover sketch and a new splash sketch. I did that while I was in college. Uh, and then I slowly but surely got more and more work. I got better. And then I was able to do a couple of more pinups. And Marie Severin, rest in peace, allowed me to do some more work. And then they offered me a chance to work as, a, as a, an art consultant doing repairs and, and uh, um, doing overall work. I was, painting, I, was, I was painting walls and washing windows. I was doing everything. And then uh, an opening happened on uh, Iron Man. And then I did the six-page Spider-Man. I forgot the sequence. Mm-hmm. But it was such a gradual thing, and I was not treated well by some of my contemporaries. They thought I was getting work just because of my last name. But there was a conflict. It was a, a sequence of things that worked well, and as I got better, I was given a little bit more work. As simple as that. But I had to really prove myself more so than most people because of my last name. I got treated pretty poorly. Yeah, that, I was. I was going to say that, and I know a lot of the stories behind what you just said. Uh, because many people think, oh, he's a Romita, so that makes it easier. No, shit, fuck, no. It made it more, more, more difficult. Because you know who is as guilty as anyone of that sentiment? My father. He said, do not expect anything and do not expect to be treated well. Keep your mouth shut, your hands in your pocket, and do your work. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if I had, if I had, if I had punched everybody that deserved it, I would still be in prison at this point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were a lot. And they were a lot. Uh, Rita Caramola, Tifoid Mace, a real, really bizarre and original design. Did Annie give you any instructions about her look? Or it was all your own? Uh, both Annie and you seem kind of wild, so I can tell. It was a combination. But uh, Anne asked, if, uh, not asked, she would make a small suggestion and let me play with it. It was a nice combination of art and writer, uh, but mostly my visuals. Okay. 
Lofran Howard says, was, is there any project that you couldn't make happen with somebody else that you're still angry that you couldn't do it? That's a great question. That's a good one. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Uh, maybe the, the projects uh, that I read when I was a young man, maybe the Fantastic Four with Stanley running it, maybe doing a regular monthly title. That would be about it. I, I can't think of anything else because I've been fortunate to play with so many brilliant writers and so many brilliant art artists and, and uh, color artists. Uh, I've been very fortunate, but I, if I had a chance <clears throat> to work with Stan Lee on, and, and Joe Sinnott playing the part of Jack Kirby on Fantastic Four, uh, that would have been, that would have been fun. Okay. That would have been fun. Javier González Delgado says, John is the history of comics, so, uh, him and his father are. Um, wow, thank you. Lita Carambola, you, you made such a great use of, bl of uh, blank space, I guess, since the 80s. Uh, did, uh, did, were you influenced by some other artists uh, to, to do that? Or that was... I, 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 there's a combination of artists in my field and illustrators that I grew up loving, Gibsons and J.C. Leyendeckers and, and uh, the Wyeths, the painters. There's a combination of so many different styles that I've enjoyed. Watching film in black and white, Film noir, uh, uh, some of my contemporaries. I mean, the the, the, the Jim Lees and and the uh, the the Kubrick boys. Uh, there's so many people of, that are my contemporaries that I will uh, look at and say, this is what I should try too. Not that I'm stealing anything, but I see some some slight subtleties that I love. Uh, I, as I said, I, I'm still learning. I have mm -hmm. so much more to learn. If I ever get to the point where I feel I don't need to learn. Then I'm going to be slipping backwards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Dante Crotogini, sorry if I mispronounced that. He has one of the most, he is one of the most prolific artists, comic book artists ever. Does he know how many published issues has he drawn? Oh, another great question. And I don't know that. If I ever find out, I probably would be surprised myself. Yeah, one, uh, guy, one guy answers 400 comics, easy. <laughs> I would love to find out. I'd love to compare it to, to guys like Jack Kirby and and find out what my longevity is and what my record is. I would love to know that. I, I don't think it compares, but I would love to find out. And there's got to be somebody equally as prolific. I just don't know at this point. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear about it. It's not important to me. It's important to still having fun and I'm loving this. It's better than having a real job. Yes. Uh, Dave Da Silva asks, will you work with Mark Miller again soon? Yes. Uh, when uh, we, we will blah, blah, sorry. will you work uh, blah, blah. Where, when will you have another creator own series soon okay see uh, I, don't, I don't want to get into details no, 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 no not the time we'll know, you'll know when it's time guys this is not that kind of thing. <laughs> we are not bleeding calls and blah blah blah, 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 blah. anyway uh, Rita Carambola biddy, 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 biddy. Francisco Sanchez in Amazing Spider-Man with JMF with Straczynski you gave another turn to your different to the different versions the different ways you had drawn the the spider guy as was he was leaner people had you know bigger heads was it a conscious effort to change your style compared to your uh, earlier eras on the book i don't remember making a concerted effort it might have just been a phase of mine i got told that i made spider-man too skinny during that those years because when i was first starting doing spider-man everybody had to be very muscular Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, he's not, he, he's not a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he's a lean teenage kid or now a young 20 something kid. And I, that may have affected me. And it may have been somebody's comment uh, over the course of time. Okay. I, like I said, I'm not so good that I can make such an effort to change things on mass. However, I did lean Spider-Man a bit. I, I made him leaner. Correct. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was a good idea or not. No, it was an amazing idea. That's the same thing that when I look at John George Perez, uh, you know, New Teen Titans, I always say the best thing he did was when he decided what he was, was a marathon runner, so he had to be lean muscles. Uh, Dick, Grayson, sure. Dick Grayson was, you know, a gym guy, a gymnast, so he had to have gymnast muscles. So I think it was defined by their, by their body step. So I think that... Of course, also, this is also a part and parcel to this, is that as I became more able... I was able, I, I would do things that I could not do 10 years before. Uh, 
So there have been improvements mm -hmm. that weren't concerted efforts. It's just I got to be a better artist and I was able to do more things. I drew cars better. How about that one? <laughs> uh, who is your favorite thinker? Williamson and Johnson are with you are superb, I think. Williamson, Klaus Janssen, Scott Hanna, Danny Mickey. Uh, oh, my goodness. My father did better work on me than anybody ever, ever did because he fixed everything. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the names I just mentioned, the, I was fortunate, just like with the writers, I had been fortunate to work with some of the greatest ink artists. I say they were artists yes. before they were inkers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Antonio Gomez Morillo, good afternoon. In a star brand, you a uh, star brand. Oh. You drew the, 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 main, <laughs> the main character flying. I love that book. I love your work on that book. Just oh, my goodness. And I always try to find. I've been still trying to find an original art page from that one, but it's not easy. But I love that. I, I love that. Anyway, let's go. Thank you. Uh, in Starman, you do the character flying in a really, you know, uh, casual uh, demeanor with uh, with his hands in his pockets, etc. It was great to see him fly that way. Was it your idea or shooters? Mine. And why? Because I needed to do something different. And it's a concerted and effort every time. And he wasn't I wanted either. to try something different. Yeah. For instance, I'll give you an example. The uh, the action comic I'm working on with Superman and his two sons. Uh, the, and Supergirl is also there. And Brainiac. And they're all flying. Five or six characters. I can't just have them all doing the exact same thing. So some of them have their knees up. Brainiac is he's flying with his arms in every which direction. The... Uh, Superboy is flying in a different direct, a different way. It's always an effort in my head to make things different, to do something different. And it can't be done because everything's been done better by, by somebody else before me. Mm -hmm. Saja says, I'm uh, loving this chat. Uh, do you not have an idea how important John Romita Jr. is for me as an artist? Thank you. Uh, oh, my pleasure. Thank you. What a great compliment. Uh, Felipe Gonzalez asks, did you make that pact with Mephisto uh, to always <laughs> look forever young? You and you and Bill Sienkiewicz? <laughs> I need to be saved. Uh, let me tell you something. Mephisto, I had so much fun changing Mephisto to an, uh, a demonic looking creature as opposed to somebody with underwear on. I, somehow the devil shouldn't have boots and underwear on. It just didn't occur to me. So I got a chance to play with Mephisto turning into the tongue and, and the evil thing. I, I enjoyed it, especially with Daredevil. Devil, Mephisto, loved everything about it. No, no, no. What he's asking is if you, as a person, made a pact with oh. the devil to look down like <laughs> you and Bill Senkevich, he said, look like you made a pact with the devil to always look down. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't understand. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. There's something to be said about being Sicilian. I just need you to know that. Yeah, Latin in general. Let's say that. Let's <laughs> there say you that. go. We look Thank for you for that. I apologize for misunderstanding what was said, but thank you for that comment. No, it was my translation, not you. He said we have something at Latin, you know, we like we like food, we like wine, we like look good life. So we look eternally young because we love life. That's it. The other thing is I started working for Marvel when I was only five years old. So that that's why I'm only forty five. Yeah, yeah, you look forty four. <laughs> that's what we know. The other thing for being a slave being a slave to your table. That added you one year in your looks, so you look 45, but I, you know, I know you're actually 44. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, how, was it, how was it starting to work on your own personal project like ICAS? Uh, would you like to do anything as, the, as a whole creator, like writer and artist? Yes, and I have six treatments that I have come up with, and one of them I am specifically leaning towards doing on my own, yes. Uh, but it's a matter of time and schedule. Um, it's got to do with motorcycles and gangs of motorcycles, mm -hmm. which means it's very difficult to draw, uh, but I won't get into it. Okay. Yes. I Just schedule and health allowing. Yes. Okay. I'll need, to, I'll need to live to be 200 to get it done. Well, but you will do it. You remember, we are vintage. We don't get old. We're classics. Like Amen. 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 Uh, Mickey Hawk, impressive. <laughs> that makes me want to start learning English because I am not understanding a word and I want to shoot myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I can't do anything about that. There's subtitles later on. There will be on YouTube with subtitles, by the way. Victor, like you. Hi from Colombia, Mr. Romita. Big fan of your work. 
Uh, David da Silva greetings from Venezuela. So we are coming international now. Did any of these people meet? Uh, did they go to Sao Paulo two years ago? Did I meet them in person? At the con in Sao Paulo. It's uh, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Yes. No idea. Uh, but, 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 uh, we have three minutes, so let me go to the end and select somebody who haven't have asked answer any questions from. Uh, uh, Juan Saiz Diaz says, I know that every story is a, is a new baby. It's like a new baby. And you can't choose between each one. But what is your best memories of all time in comics? Working with my father. Uh, I had a chance to work with Stan Lee on one issue. The Man Without Fear with Frank. And unfortunately, for the wrong reasons, uh, the 9-11 issue with Spider-Man uh, is not a favorite subject-wise, but what we did for such a horrible time, Joe Straczynski came up with that uh, premise of there are no words. It's an important piece to me. Yeah. Horrible, horrible time, but an important piece, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, because you guys put your uh, Scott Hanna as well is an integral part of that. Yeah, you guys put your soul on it, and it was really obvious to me. It was all that. I can't open it up. I can't open it up without choking up whenever I see it. Look from how else. Did you feel doing Thor something that in a way like um, Jack Kirby's, you know, um, uh, legacy? Uh, yes, 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 and yes. Sir, because of the power that you gave uh, to your version of of his of these characters. That's true, and Dan Jurgens and I both revered Jack Kirby as we were youngsters. And yes, we made an effort not to look like Jack Kirby, but to give it that strength. Yeah, that's that's also what uh, Dan told me a couple of weeks ago, that when you were talking about the book, what you told him about what you wanted to do, to treat him as real royalty, as how a god would really react. And he was that's like, correct. oh my god, this is going to be so much fun. <laughs> that is correct. Jan Dan and I had a great time on that run. Klaus Jansen, brilliant, brilliant artwork. Brilliant. Last question. This is for me. Sorry, guys. Before you leave, are you doing? Are you going? And if you can't answer, say I can't answer this because something that you mentioned before made me think about this. I would love to see you writing and drawing Wonder Woman. Could you like to wow. do that? I would like to write and draw. Yes, I don't know about Wonder Woman because I don't know enough about the character, but I would like to write and draw a title myself. Yes. Um, I mentioned drawing Wonder Woman. It's because I've done the great characters in both companies, but I haven't had a chance to draw Wonder Woman as a title, and I would like to try that. Uh, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant character. And under these times, uh, to have that character be so prominent, mm -hmm. I would like to have complete the third of the top three characters at DC. There are so many characters, but yes. And as far as writing it, I think I would need more... Uh, Education on the character. No, you can. Do it. That's not a bad idea. You love you love learning, so I'm always learning. Yeah. I am the acorn that can grow into the oak. Okay, David, let's do this again. I apologize for coming up 40 minutes short, but can we fill this up another time? Anytime you want to do this, these people are wonderful. I would love to do it again. Yeah, I will. I will, I will, we will do a, a, a sequel, episode 96.1, the sequel. So we will do it. So give me a yes. second. Don't, don't disconnect because I want to say proper goodbye to you, to all of you. Thank you so much. We're off. Yeah, John will be back. Thank you, John, for being here. Tomorrow with us, uh, Miguel Angel Gine and Cristina Duran. Love you. Sorry. Don't worry, there will be a sequel, as John said. Bye-bye. Wear your mask.